What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Total Human Optimization Podcast. I'm here with Steve Cam, the founder of Nerd Fitness. So I got to ask right off the bat, Steve, what qualifies you to talk about nerd fitness? What is your nerd street cred mm. card that you can, you can provide uh, here? I like to say I was raised by two loving parents and a uh, Nintendo entertainment system. So I was born in 84 <laughs> and I think- So you're like I, every human being of our age. So. <laughs> yes, I, I think, I think as, soon, as soon as I was old enough to, to pick up a controller, uh, I was playing through Legend of Zelda and Mario and Metroid and, and then eventually moved on to Final Fantasy and, and, and uh, really fell in love and felt like my entire childhood was shaped and molded by, uh, by video games and, and you know, video game culture. So it's been something that's been a part of my life since, since then and, and really in the past decade, I think, or maybe 15 years or so, um, let's say 10 years. Uh, I have really kind of gone all in on this idea of, of, you know, really embracing that part of me that I guess many people try to hide. They're like, they're, you know, they, they kind of like have to hide that part of it. I was like, no, like, let's embrace the fact that maybe you love to read or that you're a, uh, you know, a med school nerd or a sports stats nerd or something like use it endearingly and be proud mm -hmm. of the fact that you are very passionate or you go all in on a subject, even past the point of when most people probably give up learning about more of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really in, in, now I find that that's actually people consider that cool, you know, more than they did maybe 10, 15 years ago. You know, it's like the, the nerd, nerd is cool. Like nerd is, nerd is back. They're taking and, over. And people are appreciating <laughs> it's Yeah. People are appreciating, in, you know, intelligent people, people who go deep on certain subjects. And even I hear girls talking about it, you know, that's like something that they're, they're endeared by as well. So I think that the time, the, the time and the fortune wheel has turned to the positive side for all us fellow nerds because I was very much like you. I mean, I was playing all of those same video games. I mean, I went deep into the Dragon Warrior and Final Fantasy. I played this game called Wizardry, which was the most ridiculous game because all it was was walking around in this little maze and hoping that some algorithm would send you the right monster so you could get more weapons and spells that you couldn't even see. It was like all text-based. Yeah. And you the do most it. Ridiculous thing. And you do it. And you will do it for hours and hours and days and months forever. And you, lo yeah. and you love it. Jesus. You love it. <laughs> Love just sweaty palms, just just perspiring, just so intently trying to figure out this thing, and it was the worst game ever. Right. But you know, <laughs> it, kept, it kept me engaged. Absolutely. I sometimes wonder, like, what the hell would have happened to me if games were as good as they are now, back then? Because I was completely obsessed. Yep. I didn't even get to see the characters that I was. It was like, oh, you're a samurai. I guess because it says the word samurai, but you never even got to like see the character. You're like, oh, you're confronted by this like eight bit monster that you just have to mostly imagine. Yeah, and well, think, now it's like now it's for real. It's scary now. I, th I think, yeah, you know, and with with virtual reality being right around the corner, and you know the Oculus Rift and and these headsets that are coming in. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, when I was a kid, you, you read a text thing, you read a sentence, and it's like, okay, you have to go out and like, imagine this. And I'd go out in the woods and pretend like I was Link from Legend of Zelda. I'd make bow and arrows and like go climb trees and you know, go like right. uh, fight imaginary monsters. But as I got older, the games got better and better and better. And when life was kind of shitty, I would escape instead of using these games as entertainment, I would use them more and more as an escape. And it got to the point where you know, life was like the boring parts between me going to slay dragons in a video, you know, at, right. in, in high school, I'm a, uh, a kid with acne, braces, and a flat top at five foot two. And, but in this game, I'm this wizard that can go do anything and, and kick the crap out of everybody and actually sure. felt important. So uh, it, it, was a, it was certainly a challenge to kind of overcome that, the amazingness that games have become to realize like, no, life is, exists outside of them as well. Yeah, and I think I think that's the uh, that's the trap. That's the alluring trap is that you get to create this avatar and see like real world improvement fast. I think people get frustrated with real life improvement, even in the gym or anything, because it's slow. Like sure. the body moves like a tree bending towards light. You know, it's like you can't even hardly see it happening. It's going slow. But in a game, you put in a day's effort, you can level up, you get new spells, you get new things, and then you add in the social element of like the massive multiplayer side of things, and then you have social proof. So you get validation for what you are, and you get status based upon how badass you are, and that's that, that makes it even more tricky. Yeah, for sure. I, I hear it, and it's. Uh... I think there are many great elements to, to video games. And as you said, the social proof and the 
the I, I, you learn a lot about team building and you learn about about you know if you're part of a guild or group like you have to show up at a certain time to make sure you're all there to and people are counting on you for certain things so there are many elements that yeah you don't want to go on Leroy Jenkins you can't, you, yeah you do not want to be that guy you do not want to be Leroy running in you, like you have a you have a role to play within this greater group of, of people and those are your friends. You spend all of your time online with them, even if you've never met them in person. So there's a lot of great things that come out of games to teach you about determination and um, you know, personal responsibility. But if you're not careful, because they're so well designed, like they're triggered to specifically target you know, those parts of your brain that's like, ooh, this makes me feel good. I don't need to chase that feeling. And before you know it, days, months, years can go by and uh, you realize that you, you know, you're, you're letting your real life version of yourself kind of flounder while that online version of you, which is so much easier to see improvement upon, uh, get, gets improved a lot quicker. Yeah, I think one of the advantages I had is I'm, I'm pretty sensitive to external stimulus. So I would play games until I would literally just feel like crap. And I knew that the only thing I could do to stop that feeling would be to like go jump on the trampoline or run around outside or shoot a basketball. So like I had these like internal self like controls sure. built in because anytime I'm in front of a screen for more than you know two hours or so it like soaks into me you know what whether it's something you know on the materialist reductionist side like actual EMF or it's just something in my brainwave patterns that's creating it I have to leave and I think that's what saved me as a kid is I literally just couldn't go for these marathon sessions that I'd see some of my hardier friends just going like, I got to go guys. I got to go jump on the trail. I got to go run. I'm running sure. around. I got to do something like I'm going crazy here. But then I always come back. I've had a few of those marathon sessions and I do feel terrible <laughs> afterwards, but I can't like, I've even been in places where like, I, I know what's happening to myself and I physically feel incapable of being able to stop it. So here's a, a quick story. So I bought um, nerdfitness.com now. I guess eight years ago, but there was a there was a good year and a half where I didn't do anything with it uh, because I was playing this game called EverQuest, and I'd spent so many hours. Evercrack. To, yeah, Evercrack, exactly. So at the time, I was playing EverQuest too, actually. Um, and the computer that I had built while I was on a raid, uh, the computer actually like, blew up on me. Like the mo like the the fans inside it burned out, and I didn't realize it because <laughs> everything was so loud that I uh, I couldn't afford to fix it. So like I, I was physically unable to play this game anymore because the computer that I had built had exploded and I didn't have the money to fix it. So that's was like that was like my kind of like hero's journey call to action. Like, all right, man, it's time that you need to make a change. Maybe that website that you bought that you've been sitting on that you've always wanted to work on, but haven't maybe this is your chance to finally start working on it. And that was the day I was like, okay, this is it. I'm gonna figure out a way to make this nerd fitness thing actually help people and somehow turn it into a a business at some point and here I am on this podcast talking to you. So it looks like it worked out. Yeah, very cool, man. Because I think really the ultimate thesis is that it's not about not enjoying all these things like the video games. It's about just creating balance so that you're working on your human avatar, your video game avatar. You're working to maintain, you know, your health, your sanity, your social skills, all of these things. And at the same time, enjoying what you like. If you like video games, Awesome. Play those, but play them in a balanced way that your overall happiness and waking, sleeping, video gaming, non, you know, whatever you're doing is improved. Absolutely. And that's where, uh, that's what I've had to do as well. So right now I'm currently playing through uh, Uncharted 4, which just came out. Great game. Essentially, you're the, you're like almost like an Indian, you're an Indiana Jones type character exploring. And, and as a kid, I grew up loving Indiana Jones. So I'll still play this game, but I'll play it for an hour here and there. And then I'll put systems in place so that it's like, okay, after your hour's up, it's like, all right, dude, you have to go play the piano or the guitar or go make, you can't play until you've, you know, gone to the gym or you've worked on something, you've hung out with friends until you do this other thing. Because I know if I don't put those yeah. things in place, these things are so freaking addicting and enjoyable to play that I would get lost in it for 12 hours and, and not, not yeah. bad at I. Or you fall into the trap of your only break from playing video games is then surfing porn, which is <laughs> just switching, switching the dopamine button that you're pressing, you know? And, it, and I, know, it, I know that's the case. It's just like, oh man, I can't play this game anymore. Ah, let's just go watch some porn. Well, it's crazy. I mean, whether it's porn or, or uh, you know, drinking or, you know, I found a lot of people in the nerd fitness community, uh, their addiction is food. You know, they're, they had some, some traumatic experience when they were younger or they were, you know, almost a social, social outcast and food became that dopamine hit for them where it's like, hey, everything else is falling apart. At least I know if I go to this drive through and ask for a number three, I know exactly what I'm getting. I'm in control. And for this moment, you know, that, that is their, that's their escape. And for those, those 20 minutes when they're eating, 
you know, they're escaping and then they feel terrible afterwards. So it's really kind of digging in and understanding not just, okay, like, you don't just tell somebody don't play video games. It's like telling somebody, you know, you should stop smoking. They're like, I know I should not smoke cigarettes and I know I should exercise more, and, but I can't get myself to do these things. Once you dig in and really understand, I guess, the, I think the, the underlying reasons why they're really hooked on this stuff, you can then surround them with the right people or help them put the systems in place and um, help them create the right kind of habits so that they can finally start to break free of this thing and understand that life can be pretty great too if you take those same addictive elements from a game and apply it to real life. Sure. So is that kind of a little bit of your process of what you kind of bring to the side and in your books is just, you know, explaining the value proposition of doing these things like starting to train your body and starting to, you know, cultivate a more balanced uh, lifestyle is like with eating and with everything. Is that, is it the value proposition or how do you really get in and make that compelling case? Yeah. That, that, I think that's a fair, that's a fair way of putting it. I, my goal with nerd fitness is really to help people remove whatever barrier they have between them and the things that they're trying to do. So for many, it's like, Oh dude, I would love to, for some, it might be, they want to run their first 5k. For others, it might be like, I want to go on a date. You know, like I haven't been on a date in so long or I just broke up with a, a girlfriend of 10 years or a boyfriend of five years and I let myself go during that time and I don't feel good about myself and I want to, I want to improve how I look and how I feel so that I can do these other things. So it might be a physical goal uh, to complete something in particular. Maybe they just want to look in a mirror and, and not feel ashamed. So it's, it's helping them identify kind of what that thing is and then saying like, okay, you're reading Nerd Fitness, so we're going to approach this with some really fun metaphors and game mechanics to to get you to get your body and brain to start thinking about this in a different way so many people are like I, they think of diet and exercise it's like okay i have to starve myself only eat broccoli and chicken and i gotta go run in a treadmill for four hours and they're like that sounds miserable they get through one day they hate it and then they're like i forget it i'm i'm giving up i'm done so instead it's getting the re reframe it. it's like instead of starving yourself or withholding things from yourself you get to do you get to find out what you're capable of. And what you're capable of today might be something that's better than it was the day before. And yes, you might have to limit eating these certain things, but when you eat this stuff, it actually makes you feel better. And when you do that, it also helps you uh, run a little bit faster, get another push up in, um, deadlift an extra five pounds. And when you can equate like the video game attribute of strength to going to the gym, it's like, okay, mm -hmm. like I'm not just going to the gym and stepping on an elliptical. It's I'm going to the gym, I'm adding five pounds to the bar, and I'm adding plus one strength if I complete this particular quest, aka the workout that I'm going through. So it then becomes a challenge to find out what you can do that you hadn't been able to do before. And I think we can, just like you get addicted to leveling up in a video game, you, you two get addicted to uh, leveling up yourself and seeing those improvements. And when you see it on a bar, it's a lot easier to get addicted to that feeling than trying to get yourself hooked done. Oh, the scale dropped another pound. Oh, it went up half a pound. I'm freaking out. Oh, it's down two pounds. I now feel good or whatever. So really focusing on like, let's make it performance based. Let's, let's get you excited about the idea of improving yourself in a fun way that you're excited about. And, and then everything else can kind of fall into place after that. Yeah, no, that makes, <clears throat> that makes perfect sense. And I think, you know, the analogy of life being a video game is something that I use frequently as well. I think life really is the best video game that we could have ever created. It's you know, so good. It's, it's so, so good. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. There's no controllers except for our brain. We actually right. get to be the body. If we get hurt, we feel it. If we feel good, we feel it. Like it's all wired through. It's you know, um, eight billion players and all these animals <laughs> and levels and environments yeah. and endless. Like there's no video game that we'll ever create that's better than this life. You know, and there's there's some interesting things. Yeah, you can create monsters and you can do more violent things than you normally can in life. But, you know, if you want some of that, yeah, go train jujitsu, you know, like go to a, go to a Muay Thai gym. Like sure. there's ways to really do this, all of these things for real, except for, you know, some of the more fantasy elements of that and some of the hyper violent stuff. But that's, you know, you don't need that in this life. This life has so many things to offer. And if you really take that same approach, you know, there's, there's no telling where you can go and what kind of level 50 character you can build up yourself. Sure. So we actually talk about that. At, so you mentioned you know, like Mai Tai or uh, BJJ or, or whatever it may be. Um, just like if, if world is a, if if we are currently in a giant video game, you get to pick what kind of character you want to be. So you know we we broke we took right. the traditional video game archetypes and uh, translated them to uh, to real world training. So 
everybody in nerd fitness picks a type of character. And uh, so like, if you like to power lift, you would be a warrior. If you're more of like a crossfitter or a cross trainer, uh, you'd be a ranger. If you like to run and bike or do triathlons, you'd be a scout. Uh, BJJ or Muay Thai, you'd be a monk. Uh, gymnastics and parkour, you'd be an assassin. So like everybody now in nerd fitness, they're not just mm -hmm. like, oh, I read nerd fitness. They're like, I'm a level 14 ranger of the nerd fitness rebellion awesome. and here's my backstory and here's the alter ego from my name. So it's like, yeah, maybe we don't have dragons in real life, but it doesn't mean you can't take those really fun parts of the video game and build yourself an avatar and, and then get, get hooked on like almost role playing what that character looks like outside of your, you know, day to day life. That's awesome. Now, do you actually have a level system that <laughs> I mean, you mentioned level 14, but do you actually have, like have criteria or test yes. things? Yes. Okay. I so can... I did it old school for up until about six months ago, but it was a very, it was very pen and paper, you know, like old school D and D style where I created experience point values based on the things that I was trying to accomplish. So uh, every level was a hundred points. So let's say every time I, every quest would be 20, 20 points. So every time I crossed off five quests, it would give me a level. So those quests might be, uh, you know, set a, set a certain PR in a deadlift or learn to play a particular musical instrument, visit a certain location in a certain country, uh, become financially independent, volunteer my time, whatever it may be. So I came up with like this massive criteria. Damn, that's hard to get one level. <laughs> well, someone <laughs> that's, really, that's so, challenging. You got to learn a musical instrument, go to a different country. <laughs> so the person well, okay, best well, does that thing. Damn. So, so for, for example, one of the, one, uh, I, ha I also had master quests and some of those things I just listed would have been master quests. So I, uh, I grew up loving James Bond, like, like many people, and I decided I want to live a weekend like him. So I was like, okay, that will be a master quest. It's worth 100 points, AKA one full level, but I need to live like James Bond for a weekend. It's like, all right, what does that look like? Well, I'm not going to go shoot people and get into international espionage, but I can rock a tux in Monaco and gamble at the Monte Carlo Casino. So I was like, okay, let's dig into something really fun and find a, uh, an interesting, cheap, kind of like travel hackish, life hacking kind of way to, to do that experience. So I spent a weekend in Monaco after staying in a cheap hostel next to Monaco and ended up like making money on the weekend. I rented a cheap tux for 60 bucks, but it looked pretty good. Uh, gambled and made money at the blackjack table and came home from my experience up one level in the game of life and with more money in my pocket than when I had left. That's killer. So you were saying you were doing old school before, but now you have yes. it all kind of integrated online so people can create a profile and then kind of track their track their improvement on the way up? Yeah, so we have, um, so I wrote a book that just came out a few months ago called Level Up Your Life. And in the book, it talks about building a character, creating your quest system, assigning point values to it. So if you go to leveluplyourlife.com, you can actually create your character write your backstory, and then input your quest list and assign those point values. So as you start to cross those things off and you get to set your difficulty, uh, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, because I realize every, it's, every game is different for everybody playing, uh, and then you can level up that way. And then we also have more specific fitness quests that are more structured uh, within Nerd Fitness that we're expanding and going to make free that will tie into your character as well. So, you know, I... I I love the idea and I've been doing this for so many years that I'm, I'm doing everything I can to kind of bring this to bring bring this and make this as accessible as possible so that people can really get hooked on the idea of creating their missions for themselves or finding missions that they want to complete. And when they do these things as they're leveling up, like they're actually improving themselves physically or mentally or, you know, emotionally or whatever it may be a relationship maybe uh, in real life too. Is there a community or social element to that? Like, is there a place where people can look at other member profiles and? Yeah, so we're we're, we're just now at working on the um, making making more like a dashboard so you can see other characters. But we do have a fairly extensive free message board community on Nerd Fitness that's got like forty something like forty thousand people and forty volunteer moderators, all segmented based on how you want to play, like the Warrior Guild, the Ranger Guild, the Monk Guild. Uh, and then most people t put their character profile within their signature on those message boards, um, or they share it, you know, via Facebook with their friends and things like that. So uh, uh, most of the past year has been spent building the foundation, and now that it's working and we have people using it, people mm -hmm. creating characters, uh, we're excited to allow and hopefully continue to grow and build that experience so that people could, you know, who knows, eventually group up and and tackle group quests together or, or create guilds and and do these things and do these things in, in real life too. That's that's rad, man. That's really really cool. I'm glad that there's somebody out there doing that because it's such a such a great idea and such a great way to bridge 
you know, and really reach people who've been indoctrinated in that mindset and really understand what that's all about and give them a framework. And also, you know, one of the things that I've always found appealing about the martial arts system is that there's a belt system. You know, there's white belt, blue belt, you know, purple belt, brown belt, black belt. Well, that's the jiu-jitsu system, but there's all different colors. But you have these certain criteria where you can reach a goal and get a thing. You get a belt. You get to wear it. You get to have it. Same with video games. You get a sure. level. You get these things. And in life, you don't really usually get to have that. Usually. You know, it's just this kind of nebulous improvement. Like, yeah, I think I'm better at this than I was before. But no one's actually saying, like, yes, you've leveled up. And I think that's an, a really important thing for this, this kind of goal setting. Unless you're setting very specific personal goals for yourself, you know, you don't have that. And I think, you know, any system that can create that is going to be really, really valuable for people. Yeah. Um, two other, so I, I found a lot of rock climbers to be incredibly nerdy as well. And rock climbing has their, their ranking system too. So, you know, like the, it's, uh, if you're climbing a 0.8, uh, you know, a 6.8 or whatever, and you, and you defeat it, then you know, like, okay, now I need to try a 6.9. This is going to be slightly more difficult. And then if I fail at it, it's like, oh, man, okay, like, once I get this, then I can move up to the next one. And I think it also speaks to why the show uh, Ninja Warrior, which, you know, used to be called Sasuke back in Japan. So I, I've been watching Ninja Warrior since it was on G4 at, like, 3 in the morning back in, like, 2006. Um, but it's like, here's a level. If you complete it, you can move on to the next level. If you don't, then you don't get yeah. to move on. And like from somebody that has been raised by a video game, like that's just so appealing. It's like, here's the thing. It's right in front of you. If you can do it, then you can move on to the next <laughs> thing. Like it is so concrete and black and white. And, and unfortunately, life, unless you put steps in place or uh, structure it in a certain way, like you said, it's just kind of nebulous. Like you wake up, you go to work, you come home, you hit the gym, maybe you, you eat and... Uh, you want to work on something or, oh, you're going to write that book sometime. You're going to do that thing, but you never really get around to it. Life is too busy, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you don't incorporate like a leveling system or if you don't incorporate some sort of ranking or, uh, you know, a challenging challenge system that, that pushes you a little bit further ahead, if that doesn't exist, it's very easy to just kind of drift uh, and then just get those dopamine hits from a video game instead of putting it in, in place in real life and then getting hooked on that next belt or climbing the next most difficult rock climbing wall or, or whatever it may be. Sure. The other, I think the other risk and the other trap is to use social media as a surrogate for that. So instead of having actual goals, you just create scenarios and environments that you're going to get likes, likes become the quantification. They become the gold pieces of your life, you know, sure. or whatever these things you're trying to accumulate. Like every time you post a picture, it's like you slayed the gold man and you get, you know, this amount of, <laughs> this amount of pieces that, that add to your overall worth of some sort, you know, no. it's, it's all bullshit. It's not real. Or, or post like some, some bullshit inspirational quote with like an eagle behind it and, and it gets all sorts of likes. And people are like, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to change my life because this quote, and then they scroll to the next photo of a cat and they immediately forget the quote and they move on with their lives. But you feel really great because you've got 300 likes on your Instagram photo. Uh, when in reality, like right. that, it didn't provide any value. Nobody's going to take action as a result of that thing. It's not helping anybody. It's like, well, it's social media, just like, you know, as we mentioned earlier, whether it's porn, food, uh, drugs, alcohol, video games, it's like it can be another thing that you can get horribly addicted to if you're not careful because it's built in such a way to keep you on there and get your brain hooked on hearing that, that noise or seeing that number go up. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to me because, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate I have some friends that are in the public eye and, you know, have big followings and, you know, a bit of celebrity and I'll be out with them and I'll watch people and they treat these people like, like, you would an animal on big game, like big buck hunter. You know what I mean? It's like, they don't give a shit what that, what that person is doing, but as long as they snap that photo, a photo not for sure. genuine connection. It's just like, if I snap that photo, I get this big buck. I get the Joe Rogan buck. You know, I know I'm going to get double my normal likes. Sure. You know, just for, and really, what did you do? Oh, good job. You annoyed this dude. Like, like congratulations, but to them, they get the, they get the gratification of all, you know, the likes that they'll get on their social media, which takes the priority of like, you know, perhaps even making a genuine, you know, sure. saying something nice or, you know, having some, even if it's a minuscule discourse, something positive, but instead it's just like, ah, I got the picture. Gotcha, bitch. And yeah, I got the, yeah, I collected media. my big five, right. To po post it on my wall. Um, who said it was, a? Uh, I think it's Louis CK, uh, said, 
after a show, people come up to him and he's like, oh, dude, can I get a photo? And he's like, I won't give you a photo, but I will have a five minute conversation with you. And like, he's like, and everybody says no, like they don't even want to talk to him because they're so afraid. They just want to snap that awkward selfie with him and then post it on Facebook yeah. to tell people, look, I met Louis, you know, because if, if you don't have a photo of it, then clearly it didn't happen. Uh, same thing happens in right. concerts. You, a song comes on and you see eight million people with their phones up watching this amazing audiovisual experience in front of them <laughs> through the 4.9 inch screen on their phone. It's like, put your freaking phone down. Enjoy the fact that this amazing yeah. thing is happening in front of you because it will never happen again and you're not going to watch this shitty cell phone footage <laughs> ever. Anyway, so what's the point? Just just enjoy yeah. the moment. Ugh. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, with you. I'm with you it's a weird system it's it's just that social we're, we're creatures that are built to attract social validation you know and and i yeah. think that's where the social media is so alluring and that's why when you get into these massive multiplayer games it's also so alluring because you're getting social social proof like if if you're going out on a raid in a quest and you got some badass who happens to be wandering around that you connect with i don't know i was out of games before that but i imagine there's ways you meet people and you got that the badass wizard or whoever it is, you're like, oh, come on, come yeah. with me. That person is all of a sudden wanted and desired yeah. and valuable and useful and, and all of these things. And that's really like the fundamental craving of the human spirit. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic where we're creating like mini games within the big game that can somehow, you know, satisfy these urges. But really, we're in the big game. <laughs> and, the, and the happiest we're going to be is if we play the big game right. With sure. the mini games, with all the other games, to play the full game, you know? Because I remember there used to be mini games within the video games, too. Like, in Fishing some of the Dragon War, you'd go to, like, you'd go to, like, this little gambling hut or something like this. And you could, yep. you could play this, like, gambling game to get more gold pieces within the game, which is within the game of life. And it's just, like, this fractal, you know, representation. And, and that's, that's what all this is. But the most fun is, of course, to just play the big game. Yeah, well, so you, you mentioned social, uh, social proof or, or a sense of belonging. Back in the caveman days, like, if you weren't part of a group, like, you were 100% going to get eaten by something. Like, there's no doubt, like, you are, you are screwed. So being a part of something, I think, is woven into our DNA for, specifically for survival. Uh, same thing with sugar. You know, sugar is, is, was such this delicacy back in the, when you were a caveman. Like, you never found it. So when you did, you would eat it because it was like, oh, this, this, this thing that I might never, ever find again. But now yeah. social proof is everywhere and social media it makes it so easy for you to be connected 24 hours a day and sugar is in everything. And because we haven't fully adapted the idea that these things that we thought were so sacred and necessary for survival are now so readily available, we can't stop ourselves unless we are aware of it. And that's why that's the biggest problem, I think. So many people know they need to exercise and move more. They know they need to spend less time on their phone or playing. But in, in unless they put the systems in place, they almost feel helpless to, to get themselves to stop doing it and actually take action outside of that in this giant ass game that we're currently trying to play. No doubt. And you know, people always assume that it's a blessing that you have everything taken care of for. Oh, how lucky would it be to have, you know, every all of your needs met and everything taken care of you? Yeah, in one way you can look at it like that. But in another way, human beings need challenges. And if you if we don't have regular challenges, we won't respond we won't grow that's how a muscle grows a muscle grows from challenge breaking down the muscle and then rebuilding and repairing it the psyche grows the same way a person's character grows the same way and you know when we create these environments where all of our needs are completely met and we don't have resistance to overcome we become unhappy and you know you see that all over the place like everybody you know they'll talk about the privilege of people in wealthy countries like yes it is very privileged and there's a lot of opportunities and this it is a great blessing on some aspects, but I've traveled all over the world in some of the hardest places in the world, in Africa and different countries all over where they're really struggling for survival. And I typically see happier people in those environments than I do here. But people don't want to accept that fact. They want to sure. pretend like it's, you know, like there's some other criteria besides happiness because they don't want to recognize that resistance is intrinsic to enjoying ourselves. Like we have to, we're built to fight. Imagine a game where there was no enemies and no opponents and everything was easy. You know, you had all the gold you wanted. You walked in, as soon as you got the game, you went to the store and you could buy all of the weapons, you know, and you walked around and there was nothing to fight. That game would be the worst game ever. It'd be so stupid. Yeah, but we create that game in our real life. You know, we create this situation where 
we don't have any resistance and everything's taken care of and we think that we're going to enjoy that game. We're not going to enjoy that game. You know, that game's going to suck. You know, so we have to find out what our mission is, our real mission in life. And there'll sure. always be resistance. That resistance will come up. It won't look like a dragon, but it'll look like self-doubt. It'll look like fear. It'll look like insecurity. It'll look like anxiety. It'll look like these other things that are harder to figure out, but equally and more challenging than anything you could find represented like a leviathan <laughs> or something like that you know well i mean i think it's all i have to do is look at guys like uh you know prince and philip seymour hoffman and robin williams and michael jackson and mm -hmm. heath ledger all these guys who on the outside everybody probably looked at you know robin williams brought so much joy to so many people and he was so successful and and internally just just a complete mess and it it's it's tough. You you get far too many people, I think, who say things like, "Oh, if I just had a six pack, if I just had six pack abs, then then finally I'd be happier." Like, "Oh, if I just made a little bit more money, if I just got that promotion, if I just did whatever," and then they get to this goal and they're so horribly disappointed when they realize that that one thing didn't cure their happiness. It's like, yes, like putting goals and systems in place is really important, hundred percent. Clearly, I've built my life around it, and it's what's allowed me to do such great things. But I think you also have to remember that playing the game is often a big part of that as well and you don't just play the game so that you can get to the next level you play it because it's enjoyable and if if you're not having fun then you need to change the game you're playing so whether it's complaining about because you don't want to run a treadmill okay then don't like train in a different way or if it's complaining about your job like okay quit it's like well I can't because I have to do this other thing it's like okay well then maybe you have to do the other thing and live on a friend's couch and dip in your savings and try a different path and start at the bottom like Okay, your other option is to complain for the rest of your life and not do it, or you can roll the dice, try a different game, and see if, see if that works out for you, too. Uh, I don't know. It's, it, it's certainly a challenge to try to strike that balance between enjoying the game and gratitude, but also setting a, a high enough standard for yourself that you expect more and, and challenge yourself so that you enjoy the challenge in addition to uh, just the, the sheer joy of the fact that we are alive and there are untold billions of people that would give anything for another day on this planet that have already passed away you know no doubt yeah i mean it's it's uh happiness is always process based it's not destination based and i think that's the greatest myth there's there's really only one destination and that's you know the end of this level that we call earth <laughs> you know like right. that's that's it that's the only real destination everything else is the process and you know i i think we built that and even you know from some a religious construct that's built it Oh, you, you advance past earth and then you get to the stable victory of heaven. Well, in my mind, you know, I'm, I'm not, not to get into the nuances of the religious, you know, idealism, but that idea is, doesn't work for me either because it's, again, it's destination based. But all right, you back that down and it's like, all right, well, we'll get to retirement and then retirement will be good. Anytime you set some other thing as the happiness that's waiting for you, if you achieve this certain, you know, attribute or this certain thing, you're going to miss out on all of the That's happiness true. available on the whole whole ride like li life can be heaven on earth or hell on earth and a lot of it is choice some of it is circumstance but more more than anything it is just the accumulation of these choices that we make and how you know the vigor and the passion and the fearlessness at which we decide to play this game yeah no I, i'm very much of the same philosophy and i think for anybody listening like you know, regardless of what you think happens after this, I, I almost feel like it's my responsibility to create or become the best version of myself that I can. Like, it's my responsibility to the human race. It's my responsibility to the community, to my friends and family. Like, if, if I have this, if I can reach this particular thing, if, if, if I never find out if I'm capable, what I'm capable of, uh, and I'm waiting for what's next, like, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a rough way of looking at things. So I, I feel like a, an overwhelming responsibility. I feel compelled to create the best version of myself, to inspire others, to support others, and, and then find a, and, and enjoy myself along the way. Like, I, I have a blast. You know, um, when I'm not training or writing or running nerd fitness, uh, you can see on the wall, I have a, a violin hanging on the wall and a piano. And I try to play music for 15, 20 minutes a day. I'm not, I'm not great. Uh, but it it reminds me like music is amazing and it's something mm -hmm. I truly enjoy. I can completely get lost in it. My brain shuts off from this other thing and I'm not worried about work or what happens tomorrow or what happened earlier today. I'm just there playing music and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so. So I think for anybody that like really struggles with happiness, 
Um, yes, having some goals and working towards them is no problem, but finding a way, even if it's 5, 10, 15 minutes, to be present in an activity that causes you to lose track of time. It might be meditation. It might be art. It might be music. It can even be a video game if, you, if that's part of something that you truly enjoy. I like to make stuff or um, build things. So that's where like my happiness comes from. Other than trying to build nerd fitness, it's reminding myself every day, like, you're alive, that's incredible, do something that a dead person cannot do, that might be playing music <laughs> and hanging out with friends or whatever, I try to do that every day to remind me to enjoy, because tomorrow's no guarantee, and anything could change tomorrow, and, uh, you know, everything that I might think is important today could be completely irrelevant by then. Yeah, I mean, I think finding the present moment is one of the truest and surest ways to alleviate your suffering and to find happiness. And and I think you've named a couple of great ones. Obviously, you got a surfboard up there on the wall too. <laughs> like that's a, you know that classic example of finding flow state, that moment where you're just really in the present moment because your body's engaged, your whole spirit is engaged. And I find for me a lot of the things that do involve my body and incorporate that are some of the best ways for me to get really present. So. Um, you know, I've even started up a dance practice, you know, some people oh, call awesome. it ecstatic, ecstatic dance or where you basically just move and you don't worry about how you're moving or what you look like or anything like that. And you can be totally by yourself or you can be with other people. It doesn't matter, but you're just moving to the music and letting the music dictate exactly what you're doing. And for me, I meditate as well. And that's cool because, you know, your mind gets to find the state of calmness, but your body is kind of like ignored. It's like, sure. hey, body, go away. Stop sending <laughs> signals. Like, get out of here. You're annoying me. You're a nuisance right now. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to be consciousness. And when I'm dancing, it's a different thing. It feels like this somatic presentness that's all the way through my cells. And it's this kind of unification, not an escape from the body, but grounding straight through my heels. And I found that, I, you know, I used to find that in sports and I found that in a variety of other things. I mean, even sex is another thing. I think that's one of the underrated things that people like about it is when you're having sex, you're present. Sure. You know, like, yeah, it feels good, but the actual act of it creates a sense of presentness, which is really one of the greatest joys and satisfactions that we have. So any of these things for me that embody, that combine the body with, you know, with that kind of present moment and music is another great one. I'm, I picked up the Native American flute after I was convinced that I could not play any instrument at all <laughs> ever under any circumstance. I was a disaster. And that, that came from this like old, old belief system that when I was in fifth grade and we had a recorder concert, you know, those tiny yep, little recorders. Yep. I had a recorder concert and I was bad then. I couldn't get the song. So my teacher told me to just pretend like I was playing so I didn't ruin the song for the class, right? So like that little thing from some asshole fifth grade teacher didn't Carried want to take over For time. how many years? Decades, right? Yeah, oh. For decades. Oh, that's decades. horrible. So I was like, oh, yeah, I was like, what, 10, 11 years old? And then it took me till I was 31 years old, like 20 years before Jeez. I actually even picked up another instrument because I was convinced like, oh man, I'm terrible at that. I'll just assault people's ears, <laughs> you know? And then yeah. finally I was like, screw it, you know? And, and just went out and did it. And it's been a lot of fun. And then I've picked up, you know, a few other instruments since. But yeah, again, it's one of those things where your whole body is going into it, into this act. And um, to me, those are, those are some of the best things you can do. Yeah, I know I'm on board. I, I actually had a very similar experience. I can't remember who told me, but I was younger and I'd been singing something for some reason. I always have music going in my head just 24 seven. And because of that thing when I was younger, I just, I never sang. I told myself I was a terrible singer. And about two years ago, I wanted to prove myself wrong after having read, I think it was The Talent Code, um, where, you know, it's like, it's not, you're not born with this talent. It's that at a young age, somebody probably told you, hey, you're pretty good at this. And then as a result of that, you actually practice and you feel good about it. So then you get preferential treatment and that leads to a better coach. And that coach then gives you a chance to practice more and you practice more so you get better and so on and so forth. So actually I took a year's worth of, um, of singing lessons. Actually at the same time I was taking uh, violin lessons. And I ended up, uh, my goal, this is one of my missions, I had to stand in a street corner with a guitar and play a five song set, uh, which I ended up doing a few months ago here in New York City which I was so afraid to do and actually chickened out of it uh, multiple times until, I, until a friend literally dragged me out in the street and she said, you're doing this right now. It was like 10.30 on a Tuesday night or 10 o'clock on a Tuesday night. I was like, okay, fine. And sure enough, either nobody cared or I got, uh, or I got some nods of approval and they were like, hey, that was pretty good. And I was like, oh, all right. Like, I feel pretty, <laughs> but for those, five, you know, for those five songs, it was a really cool experience to kind of 
shoot down that that inner version of myself for tw- that for 20 years that said you suck at this don't even bother trying it's like well i'm never going to be on i'm never going to be you know a, an amazing singer but i can become not terrible and if i enjoy it and i get better at it then like what's what's the harm in that and it, it's it's one of the only times in my day you know like i said with music where i can finally shut my brain off of all right, what needs, what's the article going out under fitness or what's the next thing or how is the rest of the team doing And Oh geez, what about taxes and payroll and all these other things. And like in music, it's just like, all right, like, let's just turn everything off for 20 minutes and jam out and have a blast and, uh, and forget everything. And it's the more you can find a way, like you said, to do that. I find the happier my days are, the more content I am when I go to sleep, the more excited and the more rested I am when I wake up, the, the less stressed I get during work. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, like an additive experience to, to do that. So if I don't do it, I'll notice after like a few weeks, I'm like, I'm getting kind of antsy. It's like, well, cause you haven't touched those, you know, those instruments hanging on your wall. Like go sit down and, and hammer out some songs on the keyboard or something and, and see what happens. Yeah. I think people always think like, oh man, I need to meditate, but meditating is really, really hard actually. Honestly. <laughs> I'm so bad like, at it. It's, like it's extremely hard and everybody just says like, yeah, you know, I should do it. I really need to pick up my practice. Well, maybe, but maybe it's just not really the best way for you to get there. Like, I mean, even for me, I'm, I'm able to meditate after a lot of work at doing it. But if I go grab the flute or I grab the didge or I, you know, sit down on the drums, I can get to that similar mind state, you know, and really by engaging my whole body and, and that counts, you know, that counts in the same, that's a, that's a, that's a level up in the same category. You know, that's sure. a quest accomplished in that category that isn't just sitting down and trying to focus on my breathing, which sometimes that, it, that does make the most sense. But, um, you know, I think people look at that, that aspect of mindfulness is this really like challenging and uncomfortable and not fun thing to do. And it's easier just to watch TV until you pass out. You know, when, when, if you just find some other thing, you can really achieve some of those same goals and, you know, accomplish the quest without having to, to tackle the beast that is, you know, meditation. Yeah. I actually, I talked to a friend of mine who runs, uh, or he's the lead trainer at gold metal bodies. He lives in Japan, Ryan Hurst. And I was like, Hey, you know, like, do you, what's your meditation practice? Like, he's like, I don't meditate, but I do a lot of handstands. I was like, uh, but he goes, <laughs> have you ever lost, you ever tried to, you ever lost focus when you're upside down at a handstand? The first thing that happens is you fall over. He's like, you have to be a hundred percent present. Your vision has to be focused on a specific particular part in the ground. Your entire body is in alignment and you know, he can do like one handed handstands. So he takes it to, to the extreme. Um, but he's like, that is how I meditate is I do handstands because I know if I'm not focused, I will fall over immediately. I was like, God, that is brilliant like what a what a what a great way to immediately get your brain a hundred percent focused on the task at hand i know other people that do it like their deadlifts or like their meditation like they get like they breathe a little right. bit and every ounce and every cell and every fiber in their body is like i'm gonna pick up that heavy shit on the floor right now and everything that everything that i am everything that i'm thinking about goes towards this and if it doesn't happen and if i'm not focused then i'm not going to be able to pick this up so i better get into it so yeah I, i've i've tried to meditate countless times I've used every app. It's like hurting cats for me. Um, I, I had like a 50 day streak on headspace specifically so I could see like the little icon guy. Like they give you like an extra, yeah. like a, like a new achievement once you hit certain milestones and I hit 50 and then like one day I missed it cause I was at something. And then like, I didn't do it for like a month and a half after that. So, uh, I, I try to do it with music. I've, I try to do it when I'm sitting on planes here and there, but it's funny, like we, you know, I'm talking to you right now about all of these things. I still, I downloaded this game on my phone three days ago called Geometry Dash. Do not download this game. It is the <laughs> most, it's, two, it's like $2 and I, it's one of the most addicting, enjoyable experiences I've ever had, but it's designed so well to get you in such a flow state so quickly that like you, it, you, you'll you lose half an hour, you know, five seconds at a time. It is unreal. So like, I feel like I have some of these things figured out and the rest of it, I'm still wrestling against like, my own nerd brain sure. and my own internal physiology. That's like, yeah, dude, go play that game and sit there for 14 hours. And yes, don't worry about this other stuff. So it's a, it's a constant struggle for me to, to kind of manage this stuff. But I feel like I've cranked conquered a few of it, some of it, I guess. Yeah. It's interesting just to track your own internal proclivities. You know, like I got really super addicted to the card game, Magic the Gathering. And that, that to me, it really just ticked all the boxes. One, I love to collect stuff. 
too, like I loved the wizards and dragons and the art. Like I was collecting cards, like yeah. fantasy cards anyways. But then I could use these cards and play other people and beat them. So it like tickled my competitive side as well. Got every, and then every, every box. That's amazing. Yeah, it, like it was like every little thing. And the fact that you got to take their cards from them, like you had the anti card if you played that way. And you know, the whole thing was just like I was completely enveloped in in that in that whole framework. And if I didn't move from California, I moved from California to Texas to high school. And my number one concern was that I wasn't gonna be able to find people to play with. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> And I was right, but fortunately, like, I'm glad I was right because then I got into basketball and girls and you know, sure. the, the rest of the the rest of the things that come with with high school. But you know, really interesting to track that. And recently, um, you know, I used to play a lot with my dad growing up, and so I just hopped on the chess with friends app. And you know, we have a big company here at On It now, like 120 people. So put an email out and uh, asked if anybody wanted to play chess, gave my name, and got like a bunch of people playing. And I just completely destroyed my my like work product for an entire week because every time just the the desire for me to click that and just see if anybody'd make any moves yep. and, and then play, especially for me because I got to go like walk around the corner and talk shit if I, like I took some <laughs> bishop or something, <laughs> you know, like that. That to me it was it was just too great. It was too great an allure. So I had to finally retire. Like. I love it, but I can't do that. You know, it's consuming too much of my time. Yeah, I mean, my computer exploded, or I wouldn't be talking to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, it exploded on like the motherboard fried, the the motors burned out, and I had no money. I had no money. I had nothing saved up. I was working a job that didn't pay me very much, and I was like, I I can't afford to fix this computer. I have to do something with my life. I was playing probably 40 hours a week in addition to working a 40, 50 hour job. Like I wasn't sleeping. I was, because I had, there was, wow. there was dragons to kill and there was caves to go into and things like that. So these days, like I, I know if I played any of those online games again, I would lose, I, you'd lose me for months. So I can only, I only <laughs> let, I only let myself play uh, single player, like adventure games. Like they're going to be over in 15 hours. I can beat it. I get that mm -hmm. sense of accomplishment and then I can put it away and move on with my life. So like I'll take like a weekend every few months and just like go all in, play through a game, sit around in my underwear for two days straight, not not talk to anybody. And then I'm like, okay, ready to come out and ready to rejoin society because I know better. Like if I had to, if I try to space it out a little bit here and there, or if I let myself play those online games, it just I, I know myself too well to know that there's nothing I could do to stop myself from playing those things and, and crawling back into those holes again. <laughs> it makes yeah. sense. I think the last game I played was a game called Gun. Do you know that game? Gun. It was like, Ooh, it was like, a, it was like a Western themed, you know, you're like this Western vigilante and you steal horses and you have quests and what, bandits. Uh, and what system was it on? I think it was PlayStation. Okay. Sounds familiar. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but that was, and after that, I was like, man, you know, I can, I'm still capable of getting hooked, <laughs> clearly. Yeah. So, same thing. Like, I just, mo a lot of people have like the Xbox that, you know, controls our TV, and I was like, uh-uh, <laughs> like, nope, I'm not going to do that, yeah. you know, because that's just a, it's a trap that I'm, you know, I enjoy it while I'm doing it, but I have, I get the deepest satisfaction about playing this game of life, you know, and going sure. after this mission for real, whatever my own dragons and caves and treasures and, and things are, and uh, so I, I, I know better than to give myself too many surrogates or it takes my eye off the big prize. Well, you, so you just mentioned something that I thought was really interesting. So the fact that you were like, oh, an Xbox that controls my TV, I know if I have that, there's nothing I will be able to do to stop myself. So you actively chose to not bring that into your house. So like I found myself watching reruns of Seinfeld during my lunch break, you know, I'd, I'd come back from the gym and I'd sit down and next thing I know I'd be watching. So I was like, what, I've seen these 10 times before. Like I don't need to watch this again. But I couldn't get myself to stop, so I, I canceled my cable. Um, you know, it's like this is the only – because if it's available, I will do it. Therefore, I do – you know, uh, at Nerd Fitness, we call it hacking your bat cave. But ultimately, it's like hacking your environment. Yeah. Uh, to, right next to me, I, this is like – this is the guitar stand, and I have a little violin stand too. So normally, these instruments sit right next to me while I'm sitting at my desk so that I stare at them all day long. And just that one simple movement of taking it off the wall and out of the way into the middle of my living room floor – is enough for me to increase or increase the likelihood of me picking up this instrument and playing. And by canceling the uh, canceling my cable and by not keeping any junk food in my house, anytime my friends come over, they're like, "What do you eat all day long?" I was like, "I don't," because if it was here, I would eat it. 
you know, so like I just, I, I use my laziness to my advantage and say like, I don't keep it here. And I, you know, what's that? I increase the steps between me and a bad habit. And I decrease the steps between me and a good habit I'm trying to build. So whether it's playing music or not watching TV, I hack my environment, AKA hack my bat cave to uh, not rely on my brain. Because if it was up to that, I would justify and uh, I would justify anything like, Oh, I earned this or I did that. And I, I have to, I have to put those systems in place or nothing will ever get done. Yeah, it's, I think people don't, people fail to realize how many close to 50, 50 balls there are in life. You know what I mean? Like, for me, the, the position of, like you mentioned the instrument, like where my flute is in the house, you know, can definitely determine whether I'm going to play it that day or not play it that yeah, day. Yeah, 100%. You know, like the simply, like if I left it in a room that's on the other side of the house, I don't have like a mansion or anything. It's not like it takes me a long time. But if I had like left it upstairs or something like that, I'm like, ah, screw it, it's upstairs. <laughs> you know, and I just yeah. won't do it. Whereas if it's right there, then maybe I'll play for 20 minutes, you know, but... It was just that I was right. The decision to do it was so close to 50-50. You know, walking that flight of stairs would just put it at 49.9 rather than 50.1, you know, which was just the tipping point that was the difference between me doing that and doing something that could bring a lot of quality to my life or not. It's interesting. So I think that idea of, you know, giving yourself these little edges, even if it's just like this small advantage or this small obstacle to doing something that's not beneficial. Well, think about, big difference. Uh, think about uh, in casinos, you know, blackjack. It's like 50.01% in favor of the house to 49.99 in favor of the player. So it's just tiniest sliver in favor of the house. And that tiny sliver is enough to make that game so much money in the long term in every casino across the country. If it wasn't stacked in the casino's favor, it wouldn't exist. You know, like they wouldn't have it if in the long term it, right. it wouldn't work out. So I'm very much the same way. I, I took... Uh, violin lessons for months and I would come home every week with the violin in its case and I'd put it down in the corner and then I would tell myself well I need at least 20 minutes to practice but it's going to take me five minutes to take it out of the case and rosin the bow and tune the strings <laughs> screw it you know I don't have time to do that but when I bought this cheap ten dollar stand as soon as I came home from my lesson I put it right in the middle of my floor immediately after I came home and told myself I only had to practice for two minutes a day sure enough those two minutes became five minutes became ten became twenty and I got I got, I don't know, 10 times better in, in a month than I had made than compared to the previous six months prior to that, simply because I allowed that 50.1% to fall in my favor instead of fall against me. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, my favorite violinist right now is this, uh, is this woman named Christian Lien. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but... I'm going to write this down right now. Okay. Definitely check her out. She, she has some... Um, I got to see her uh, on the on the ship summit at sea she performed oh, out cool. there and it was it was really really dope christian lien i think is l-i-e-n okay i think is her name she's on itunes and stuff but cool. i think you you definitely dig it well man this has been a real pleasure um chatting with you here how can people find you and see your book and site and all of that good yeah, stuff yeah uh we publish two free articles a week at nerdfitness.com uh you can learn more about the book at levelupyourlife.com and on level up or nerd fitness you can create your own free character pick your class write your backstory start tracking your quests and uh, leveling up and then i hang out on twitter and instagram at steve cam s-t-e-v-e-k-a-m-b very good well thank you my friend we'll have to do this again some other time i really enjoyed it i'll keep you posted next time i'm in austin i'll bring my violin and i'll play crappy violin while you shred the uh Native American flute. <laughs> Shred the Native American flute. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, be quite, it'll be quite a sound we're creating. We're going to be awesome. All right, Listen for our EP. <laughs> that's, that's right. You have a good day, brother. You too, dude. All right. See ya. Bye-bye.